Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the number one international best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. Now, did you notice anything different about the beginning of this episode? I'm sure you did. Yes, it's the music. Well, Today is a very special episode, and we have the great musician David Young as our guest. Many call David's music the most heavenly healing music on the planet. With over 20,000 healers and healing centers using his music every day, David has had two Grammy nominations, has sold over a million CDs, has had 10 million streams of music downloaded. David also hosts meditation events. It is said that more people have had out-of-body experiences listening to his music than any musician alive. Over 7,000 attendees at his over 400 events have had extraordinary experiences, including spiritual travel, speaking to ascended masters or archangels. Some have even reconnected with their loved ones in heaven, and others have had past life experiences. You can find out more about this wonderful man at his website, davidyoungmusic.com. David Young, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Thank you so much. Nice to be here with you. Oh, nice to have you too. And I've heard your music and it's heavenly is an understatement, if that could even be said. It's just really fantastic. So thank you for your love of music and your love of wanting to share it. You are. Oh, you're, you're welcome. I started playing when I was a kid uh, in third grade and I was the worst in my class in third grade, but we got a second year of the recorder. That was the instrument that we all were given. And um, I got the hang of it in the second year, and then it, I really caught on with it. And, you know, I've made a whole career from playing the recorder. You know? I, I know. I mean, it's incredible. I mean, I think that's what a lot of us kids started playing. But it's more than that, because, you know, if you see a great work of art, like a painting or something, or you hear great poetry, you know it's, like, divinely inspired. Your music, to me, is that. So can you give us just a little bit of your your a little bit more of your background besides just being a kid um how the passion for music started and is it just the recorder I know that's I know the answer to this but I want you to explain and 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 is was sure. there like a I don't want to say a divine pull but kind of that you just knew this was right Well um I've recorded 60 different albums of music, of which 50 of those are instrumental music, where the recorder is the main instrument. And then there's 10 albums I have that I sing and play guitar with positive songs. Um, What happened was that I had a book that I released uh, in 2014 called Divine Inner Guidance. And it's about the incredible things that happen when you listen to your intuition as well as the incredible things that happen if you don't listen to your intuition. Because, you know, they're both incredible. Right. One is enjoyable and the other one isn't, you know. And um, I was doing these events, and after talking for about an hour and explaining stuff from my book, I would tell the audience, okay, I'm going to play the flute now for 20, 25 minutes, and why don't you guys all close your eyes, and let's all meditate as I play, and let's see what happens, you know. Um, Because at that point, I'd been meditating – um, about 34 years and I had experienced different levels of inner peace in my meditation. You know, I would see the purple light most often. Sometimes I would see the white light. David, but I have the, to interrupt just for a second because we're here. I'm hearing a lot of um, background noise and I just don't know if it's your microphone moving or. Uh, a um, how is this? <laughs> yeah. uh, good, 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 good. Better. I just okay. did. I, and I just, I hate to, Break your flow of thought no there. Okay, back That's to not you. A yeah, so I'd been meditating for thirty about thirty four years when I started doing these events, and you know I wanted people to open their mind and just allow their logical mind to get out of the way, um, because most people think that their logical mind is their intelligence, but our logical mind is just what we've agreed to accept that everybody else has agreed to accept. So if you were living 500 years ago, um, all the people had agreed to accept that the world was flat. That's right. And 
And you could actually be put in jail if you said the world was round. Um, and it took a while after Columbus, you know, discovered America. It took a while of of people believing that the world was not flat and that it was round because people for so many thousands of years had believed um, because fear is a powerful thing. And people believed that there was an edge of the of the world that you could actually fall off of, you know, or take your boat off of. And so the same thing is true with people understanding that there's life after this life, because um, in the last, you know, in the last 15 years, the whole idea of people having a near death experience has really come out into the public. And, you know, the most popular books on the New York times bestseller lists are books about, People having near-death experiences, like Dr. Eben Alexander's book, Proof of Heaven, that right. sold over six million copies. So, you know, I would I would talk to people about about different things that I had learned spiritually, and then I'd start playing the flute and I'd play for 20, 25 minutes. And when the meditation was over, um, and people came back into their bodies, I asked if anybody had anything that they'd like to share. And there were five people at that first event who all shared that they had reconnected with one of their loved ones, could be a grandmother or a mom or a dad or a friend from childhood who had died young. And people explained this like it was the most normal thing ever, and they were really happy to have that experience. Some people were channelers, and so they were familiar with the idea of having that type of experience. But many people were not channelers and were just incredibly surprised to find out that this was possible. Well, the funny thing about this is that I didn't know this was possible when I was playing the flute at these meditations. So when the first five people shared, inside my mind, I was going, I can't believe what these people are saying. I never experienced anything like that. I didn't even think it was possible, and I thought that being skeptical of something like that showed people that I was intelligent. Mm. That's a problem that many people have is that um, we're taught about what is normal and what's not normal, but all of these things that are based on normal are totally connected to a time period. You know, I mean, 50 years ago, if somebody would have said we would have a man walking on the moon, that would have sounded like the most ridiculous thing ever. How would it be possible for a man to walk on the moon, you know, but now because of all the advancements in technology, it's totally normal to to see things from a space, you know, from when the different NASA spaceships landed on the moon. We've seen that so many times, it doesn't even seem special. Isn't that interesting? Even our you know, cell phone technology, look how special that is. And it's just you know, become normal. Absolutely. You know, one of the things that I talk about at my workshop sometimes is that you know, if you would imagine an Eskimo, an Eskimo has learned how to live in an impossible climate to survive in. What an Eskimo lives with on a daily basis is something that none of us could ever survive in because it's taken generations and generations of their ancestors to find a way to survive. But if you would tell an Eskimo who's never seen electricity, who's never seen a cell phone, if you could tell an Eskimo that you you pick up this little thing that's about four inches by two inches and you hit a bunch of numbers on it and you can talk to somebody on the other side of the world, they would say, you must be crazy. <laughs> why, why, why would I ever believe that that would be possible? And then you could tell them, well, I can, I can take this a step further. You can call somebody in Africa and then hit a little button that says merge call. And somebody from China could also be on that conversation. So you in Alaska in an, es in an igloo could be talking to one person in Africa and another person in China at the same time. Take it that one would step be, further. From their perspective. And you can would, FaceTime yeah. and you can see that person. Right. Those people. Sorry yeah, to interrupt absolutely. you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I'm right with you because I use that example too. But from the logical mind, mm -hmm. based on, on the perspective of an Eskimo, 
that seems impossible. It seems ridiculous. You know, it would almost be insulting. Like, are you kidding me? You expect me to believe that? Now, if you went back 100 years before we had microscopes, a person who got an infection, an infection, you could die from an infection because they didn't have, you know, antibiotics and whatever it would take to, to kill an infection. Where nowadays you get an infection, you go, there's probably a hundred stores within 10 miles of where you live, if you live in a city, that you can get medicine for that. Where a hundred years ago, that would be something that could kill somebody. Now, it didn't mean that people were dumb a hundred years ago. It just meant that the technology had not gotten that far where there were solutions for this stuff. And the more things change, the more our reality changes. And so the way our reality has changed is that the idea of us having a near-death experience doesn't mean anybody's crazy. It doesn't mean that anybody's lost their mind or anything. It just means they've had an experience that many other people just haven't had yet. Yet is the key word in that sentence. Right. Because every every single one of us eventually has a near-death experience because as we get older and we get into our 70s and 80s and 90s and we get closer towards our final transition from this physical body into our higher self or our soul body or our heavenly body, as we get closer to having that experience, we naturally start having near-death experiences. Now, somebody shared an experience at at one of my events, um, and this was in Phoenix, And this guy was about 70 years old. He said he'd never meditated before. And he said, I started playing the flute, and he found himself on this boat. And it was a big boat. And he said his grandfather was there. And he hadn't seen his grandfather in 35 years because he had died 35 years earlier. And he said his grandfather looked exactly as he looked 35 years ago, the way he remembered him. And because his grandfather was a farmer, he still smelled like the way he smelled, you know, back in the day, because our loved ones will use every one of our senses and every single thing possible. So we make more of a connection with them. And so our logical mind is easier to accept it. So he was talking to his grandfather and then his other grandfather appeared right next to him. And his other grandfather was a cabinet maker when he was alive. And his other grandfather said, you know, you sold one of the cabinets that I made in a garage sale a couple of months ago. And I put a lot of love into that cabinet that I made. And that cabinet should be in in our family and stay in our family. And you should find the guy who bought that cabinet from you who lives in your neighborhood. You should find that guy and get that cabinet back because that that's a family heirloom. It should be in our in our family. Okay. And this was ex- totally true because he had a garage sale where he sold the cabinet. Well, after they were talking for about 10 minutes in the heavenly dimension, his mother appeared. And this made him really worried because his mother is still alive. Mm-hmm. His, mo- his mother has dementia. And so his two grandfathers could see how concerned he was that his mom was there because, you know, he was concerned if, if she was going to be crossing over soon you know and um his grandparents could see that he was really concerned and troubled about this and they said oh don't worry about about your mom being here with us because she has dementia she's actually more here with us now than she is with you and when your mom says things that don't make any sense it's because she's already transitioning up here with us and she's more up here with us then she is down there with you. That's why she says things sometimes that really don't seem like they make any sense. She's already transitioning with us. She's more up here with us than she's down there with you in the physical. Interesting. I've heard something like that before, something similar. So that's just more validation. Yeah. Yeah, I've done 400 of these events called a portal between heaven and earth in four years. I've had enough validation for like, 2,000 people Um, because the consistency in what people share at my events is incredible. 
Um, one of the things that brings people to be interested in this subject of near-death experiences is when when people lose somebody who they love dearly. Yes. And there was a there was an event that I did in Long Island, and when the meditation was over, there was a woman on the right side of the room who started to talk, and she said she was a channeler. You know, she was a professional psychic. And she said during the meditation, a young man appeared to her in his 20s, and he told her that his mom was on the other side of the room. I don't remember what his name was, okay? Um, and so she points to this woman on the other side of the room and, and said, do you have a son um, who, who died about 10 years ago? And this woman was – it was hard for her to speak because she was crying so hard. But she said, yeah, my son died 12 years ago that day. Wow. She came to that meditation event that night, and her son appeared to somebody on the right side. And the woman who was channeling the son, you know, the mom is sitting on the left side of the room. Um, she said, your son wants to tell, tell you that, mom, please let go of the grief. She's, he said, I've been up here in heaven for a long time, and I'm working my way into the higher levels of heaven. But when you pour out your grief towards me, it pulls me back down from these higher places that I'm, I deserve to be in. And it pulls me down here to, to the lower levels because you have this, this grief. And mom, you need to let me go. You don't need to worry about me. I'm happy here in heaven. I'm, it's amazing up here. It's beautiful. The energy is so much better and higher than the energy on earth. So, mom, please let me go and just live your life and find happiness in your life. But quit doing this because it's really dragging me down. And, oh, you can imagine that this woman on the left side was bawling her eyes out at this point. Yes. And – and the woman who was channeling said, you know, your son is showing me that he's with Padre Pio. And, and he says that this means something to your mom. Well, the last two years of her son's life, before he died, he got fascinated with Padre Pio. And he put pictures of Padre Pio all over his bedroom, completely covered in the walls in his bedroom. That was a confirmation to this woman that this really was her son because nobody in the world would know something like that. No, definitely not. I like your stories. You have some more? <laughs> I do. I'm known as the guy who plays two flutes, the guy who wears the puffy shirt because I wore a puffy shirt for like nine years when I first got started with this stuff, and the guy with all the stories. Okay, so oh, I'll tell you another story. Well, let's just for the listener right now, th there's some great, YouTube videos and I'll connect one to this episode um, in the description. But when he says two plays two flutes, that's at the same time and he can play them in harmony. And it's just amazing. I can't even imagine how much practice you put in to perfect that. It took me six years of practice. No, I'm sorry. Three years of practicing six hours a day. Yeah. Oh, um, incredible. And now I can play two flutes at one time and you can ask me math questions and I can, I can do multiplication when I had while I'm playing two flutes just because I've been doing it at this point for 29 years. You have mastery over it. Yeah. Yeah. I, second nature. I did. For sure. Wow. Um, back to the you know, stories. If you, yeah. Go ahead. Back to the stories. <laughs> no, no. Okay, well, so, say whatever you want. I'm totally engaged in whatever you want to say because this is fun for me. Well, I'll go into the next story. I okay. think we should focus the time on this. Um, yep. So a woman came to an event in Syracuse, New York, and – there were 40 people at the event, and when the meditation was over, she shared that Martin Luther King showed up to her in her meditation. And Martin Luther King told her he had work for her to do in two to three days. Now, all 40 people in the room heard this woman share this. Two and a half days later on Monday morning, she posted on my Facebook page that her boss called her into his office on Monday morning and put her in charge of the Martin Luther King Fund at their company. And she didn't know there was a Martin Luther King Fund at her company. Wow. You know what that's called? 
normal. Normal. Yeah, this stuff happens at my events every night. Oh. I've done 400 events in four years. That's a lot. You're a busy man. Well, someone's got to do it, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me just ask, because I know from all these interviews and my own meditation practice, there's definitely something available by quieting the mind. But it's like you bring it to a whole nother level. What do you think is in... I don't want to say in your music, but kind of like that puts people in that zone for that connection. Do you have any thoughts on that? Because it's. I do. Yeah, I do. It, it's, it's actually a couple of things. Okay. Um, well, when I play the two flutes at one time, um, the two notes create what's called a triharmonic tone, where the two notes actually create a third note. I'm only playing two flutes, but they create three different notes because the harmony between the two of them creates this third note that's a frequency. Okay. Okay. Um, it's not a physical thing, but you can actually hear it. Now, in heaven, everything is ba based on light, vibration, and frequency. So when people have a near-death experience, they're seeing this inner light. And they're hearing these inner sounds, these heavenly sounds that are a frequency. That frequency is the same frequency that my two flutes create as the third note. Okay? So when people hear the, me playing the two flutes at one time, the, the, they've heard that frequency before when they had a near-death experience, because that's part of the experience. You experience the inner light and the inner sound. Yes. And the inner sound is this frequency and the vibration. And that's what I create in my music. Now, when I make my CDs, I don't feel like my CDs are done until I feel that, um, that inner peace that I have after meditating for a half hour. Because the first 10 minutes that you're meditating – Nothing good's happened in the first 10 minutes because your mind is so used to thinking and planning and doing what your mind normally does. It's busy. It takes it. Yeah, being busy. It takes at least 10 minutes, sometimes 15 minutes for your mind to settle down because you it realizes that you're not giving it any, any attention. So eventually it quiets down. And in the space between your thoughts, that's where you can receive messages. Because if you had two radio stations playing one by your left ear and one by your right ear, you wouldn't be able to benefit from anything you were hearing because you're hearing two different messages at one time. When, Likewise, when your mind quiets down and gets out of the way, then you start getting messages from spirit. And, and you know, that's when the good stuff happens. So if you meditate, I would really advise people to not meditate with a clock if if you don't have to be anywhere, like in a certain amount of time. And to go into the meditation, just you can even use something like, you know what? I'm going to be meditating here the whole day, even if you're not going to meditate the whole day. But you tell your mind, you know what? I'm not putting a time limit on this. I'm going to just go into this and stay in the and go into the deepest peace I can. And you'll find that after a half hour, you get to a different level because there's more space in between your thoughts. And if you stay in it another 10 minutes, after 40 minutes, you go to a deeper level because there's more space between your thoughts. You're relaxing more and you're allowing yourself to receive, you know, and then it, I've, I've meditated for an hour and a half, two hours. I've meditated for three hours at, at certain points. And I'm telling you, all of the saints and all of the ascended masters, they all meditated at times for long periods of time. Because it takes a certain amount of time for your mind to get out of the way. And then once you get into those deeper states or those higher states, there's so much love and the, the feeling is so beautiful. You really don't want to stop. That's where you want to go. Whatever it takes to get you to, to relax that in that kind of way without having a time limit, that's – that's where all the good stuff happens in meditation. Like this, there's a joke that people say that this guy tried meditating for five minutes and it didn't work. Hmm. Of course it didn't work. Nothing happens good in the first five minutes, you know. 
When you go to the gym to work out, you don't break a sweat necessarily in the first five minutes. It takes you 20 minutes to, you know, for your cardio to get pumping and for you to sweat. Um, and, you know, that's the healthy part when your heart is really pumping and when you're sweating. And in meditation, the healthy part, the best part is once your mind gets out of the way and it, it's going to take time for your mind to get out of the way. David, I had somebody say, I don't even remember where, but was talking about meditation and it's a personal experience for everybody. So it's not that easy to just say, oh, this is what it's going to be like. But he says, imagine you're living in a city and you're trying to look up at the stars and you can't even see any stars because the the sky is just brightly lit with all the lights coming from the city. But then he mm -hmm. says, you go to some remote area where there's no lights for just miles and miles and miles. And the sky is so deep and dark and just how many stars you see and how bright. And so he was trying to explain the difference between a busy mind and then, you know, like working out at the gym for a while, meditating, that there's just this level that, and it just like, I, I'll always remember that vision of seeing all those stars like that in my mind's eye. So it's personal for everybody, but there is something available. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's no doubt. There's no doubt. Um, the benefits of meditation, like one of the things that I, I found out at one of these conferences is that last year, these doctors um, made a comparison of what the experience was like for somebody who had a near-death experience compared to somebody who had a lucid dreaming experience and also to somebody who who had a deep spiritual meditative experience and all of the qualities of all three of those things were the same. You know, every time we go to sleep, mo most people don't realize this, but each time you go to sleep, whether you remember your dreams or not, you're going to the other dimension. You're going to the heavenly dimension. And whether you call it the heavenly dimension or dream world, it doesn't matter because it's six of one, half dozen of another. Dream world is the same thing as the heavenly dimension. That's why when we lose somebody who we love, within a week of us losing somebody who we love, they always or most of the time appear to us in a dream. That's God way, God's way of showing us that they exist in the dream world and they're saying hello and they're okay. But in our culture, we don't necessarily look at dreams, at least we haven't, as important, credible things. Most people look at dreams as they don't matter. But our dreams do matter. And once in a while, when we're dreaming, something happens that triggers our awareness in dreamland. That our physical body is separate from us and our physical body is down on earth in our bed sleeping. When that happens, our soul does what's the most natural thing for our soul to do, and it starts to fly. Because in the physical dimension, the natural way that we move is by walking. In the heavenly dimension, the natural way that we move is by flying. Because if you have a choice to walk down to the store and get a, a carton of milk, or to fly down to the store and get a carton of milk, you're going to fly down to the store because flying is fun. Mm -hmm. Now, in the physical dimension, we have this unique thing called gravity. And every minute that we're alive in this physical dimension, we're subject to that law of gravity. It's part of our reality. But in the heavenly dimension, they don't have the same limitations that we have in this physical world. They don't have gravity in the heavenly dimension. That's why people fly around all the time. That's why angels are are seen with with wings. They don't you don't need the wings, but the wings are the symbol of of the fact that you can fly in that dimension. I have another question about your music and tapping okay. into this other dimension. Are there experiences besides these reconnections that people have gained? insight into their life have they spoken to someone that is 
I mean, I said it in the introduction, the ascended masters are archangels, but given information that they can use to empower them in their current life. Every night I do an event, people, five or 10 people share that. I mean, I had one event where there were 25 people in the event and 18 out of the 25 people ended up sharing an experience with Jesus, his wife, Mary Magdalene, or Mother Mary. 18 out of 25 people. At this point, um, let me tell you how, how that whole thing started because it was really uh, – uh, it was an adventure for me. After about six months of me doing those events, about 500 people had shared that they had a conversation or spiritual travel with one of their loved ones or a friend from childhood who died young. And after six months of hearing this three or four times a week at my events, you know, with maybe five or ten people at a, every event sharing it, it became a part a normal thing. It didn't surprise me anymore because I'd heard so many people share it. It just was like a normal thing. And then something really bizarre happened at one of my events, and three people all saw Jesus standing in the same spot in the room. And I was like, I didn't even know what to think about that. And honestly, when the first two people shared, I thought they were crazy. But when the third person came up to me at the end of the event and whispered to me and said, I saw him standing in the same spot. But I didn't want to say anything in front of everybody else. I was like, oh, my God, this is for real. You know, there was something about this shy person coming up and whispering that to me that outweighed my skepticism about it. And there was a guy named Bob Murray who was a famous channeler who was talking to me. I was able to call him just about every day for two years, and he was able to explain to me why these people were having these experiences. Because I never had an experience like that. I didn't know what to think about it, and he helped me understand it. So I asked Bob, I said, hey, Bob, you've been channeling for me for about a year at this point. Three people saw Jesus standing in the same spot in the room, and um, I think we should have a talk. Uh, because I grew up in a Jewish family, and this was an absolute mind blower for me. Mm -hmm. Um so he said, I can't guarantee it, but I can try. And after about a minute, he said, okay, Jesus has, has appeared. He's here. What do you want to ask him? My mind went blank. I couldn't think of anything to say. And all I could think <laughs> of was, oh, my God, this is so weird. Growing up in a Jewish family and having a conversation with Jesus, that is like, that's like the weirdest thing in the world, you know? And he said, I can understand that. I grew up in a Jewish family also. That's the first thing he said to me. I swear to God, you know, and I said, can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Because I don't know what to believe about what I've heard about you. I also don't know what not to believe about what I've heard about you. So what do you like or what don't you like? You know, if you're meeting somebody from 2000 years ago, a complete other time period, where do you start a conversation like that? And Jesus, no less. Right. You know, and especially because I grew up in a Jewish family where we weren't even allowed to say his name in our house. So the first thing he said was, I don't like rituals. When people do rituals, I think they're getting closer to God. But a ritual is done so many times mechanically over and over again. It's really not coming from love. It's not coming from the heart. And the only way we get closer to God is through opening our heart and through love. And at first I thought he was talking about the Catholic Church. But the more I thought about it, every religion has rituals that people do over and over again. And after a while, it's not coming from love. It's just a mechanical thing. The second thing he said was, I don't like pedestals. When people put others up on high pedestals, the only thing they get is a stiff neck. And I thought that was pretty funny. Um, mm -hmm. And then the third thing he said was just an absolute mind blower. I never, ever thought I'd, I'd hear him say something like this. And he said, I did not create Christianity. Wow. What a zinger that was, you know. A couple of weeks later, I was sharing this with one of my friends who, coincidentally, or the way this was all planned out and orchestrated, this friend had just read a book that was supposedly channeled by Jesus to the writer. And those exact words were in the book. Now, since then... Five other people have come to my events, and when I shared that part, these five other people raised their hands and said, you know, I had a channeling experience with Jesus, and 
he he told me I did not create Christianity. The exact same words that, that you just shared. So why would you think, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious, but why would you think that he would say the same exact thing to six different people? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, it's because it's the truth. <laughs> Two, because he wants people to be able to validate each other's experiences. You know, th- when I when I heard my friend two weeks later share that, that he said the same thing in this book, it made it even more believable. It was a confirmation for me. And that confirmation was valuable for me. And so as, as time went on, you know, the next weekend, Jesus, Mary Magdalene, and Mother Mary came and showed up to people at my events. And then the next week, they showed up and somebody else had an experience with St. Germain. And when I say they showed up, I'm not saying that I saw them. I'm saying that normal people in the audience shared their experience with them. They could have had a healing. They could have been joking around. Um, they could have, you know, sometimes the Ascended Masters connect people with their loved ones and they're the bridge for that. Sometimes people connect with their loved ones without the Ascended Master making that connection for them and connecting them, you know. But then the following week, somebody had an experience with Buddha. Um, Buddha always shows up to people under this gigantic tree that's so high they can't even see the top of it. It's the tree of life. And about 75 people have shared their experience with Buddha over the last four years. And these are 75 people who had no preconceived idea about what the other 74 people experienced with Buddha on a different night in a different city. And they all share this. That's a consistent thing that, that people share. And, you know, then Moses appeared to people and um, Gandhi appeared to people and every ascended master you could name, every archangel that you could name. There are people who have said at my events that there were more archangels in the room while I was playing than they had ever seen in their entire life. And at this point, over 2,000 people have shared their experiences with one of the ascended masters and one of the archangels. And I have to tell you that the way we look at religion and spirituality in this physical dimension is not the way that it works in the heavenly dimension. Because in the physical dimension, everything gets separated. You either go to this church or that synagogue or that temple. If you go to this one church, you're never walking into one of those synagogues or one of those temples, most likely for your whole life. Because everything is separate in this physical world. That's what our mind does. But in the heavenly dimension, everything is connected. Many times people talk about this thing called oneness in heaven that they experience in their near-death experience. All the ascended masters are on the same team. They're not in competition like it looks like in this earthly dimension. There are people who come to my events and share they had an experience with Yogananda, Gandhi, and Jesus. Or other people will say they had an experience with Buddha and Krishna and Jesus. There's no higher or lower like that. They're all so highly evolved. They're all they're on such a high level that there's no point trying to figure out is is this guy more spiritual than this person or you know what I mean? That's that's earthly stuff. That stuff doesn't exist in the heavenly dimension. So there's no point taking physical limitations that we've been taught. Like physical limitations, like a man will never walk on the moon, like the world is flat. You know, those are physical limitations that don't exist in the heavenly dimension. So when you meditate, you don't want to allow those physical limitations to carry over into the heavenly dimension in your meditation where those limitations don't exist. Yeah, the sky's the limit. Well, even beyond that. David, time's going by fast. I just want to ask you, We want. I want to get back to the music too, but uh, you made a, kind of a controversial statement about Jesus, and I just want you to mention your book and how that information came about him being married, because I'm sure other ears picked up like, what? <laughs> okay, well, he, here's the thing. Um, the Bible is not Jesus' story. That Bible... That- Bible story was made up 
because they didn't understand where his body disappeared to. And one of the things that happened at my events was that many people, many people shared their experiences with Jesus. And he showed up with Mary Magdalene and it was, they're married. They're getting ready to celebrate 2000 happy years of marriage. I don't know who else can say that, but that's supposed to be a, a joke. I'm but laughing. I you didn't think I, that was so funny. I, but, I keep it um, on mute just so I'm not making too much noise in the background, but <laughs> well, I'm laughing. <laughs> okay. Um, everybody knows Jesus was Jewish. His real name was Yeshua. You will never meet a Jewish person named Jesus because Jesus is not a Jewish name. Yeshua was, was the name he was born with. Now, there are five references in the Bible where he's called rabbi, okay, because he was a rabbi. And there's two prerequisites you have to have before you can become a rabbi. You have to have a wife and you have to have children. It's like the opposite thing about the Catholic Church where they don't want priests to get married mm -hmm. and have children, okay? Well, in the Jewish religion, they want people to, to get married and have children because it was actually intelligent because then – these people would be – these rabbis, the men, would be satisfied sexually, and it would be safer for everybody. I wish that the Catholic Church would take that advice. You know what I mean? Because the original priests for the first 381 years were allowed to marry. They did have wives, and they did have children. But after about 300 years, the Catholic Church realized that every time a priest died, their land and their money was inherited by their wife and their children. So the Catholic Church made this law only so this way the church could inherit the land and the wealth every time a priest died. It had nothing to do with being holy. It had nothing to do with anything. Isn't that it, interesting? I've not heard that before. Well, hello. Hello. You know, it makes a, you know, it makes a lot of things make sense. You know, mm -hmm. now so many people had experiences with Jesus, Mary Magdalene, and Mother Mary at my events. It's actually over a thousand people. And do you want to take a wild guess how many people that had a healing or some beautiful experience with one of them, how many people they said some scripture from the Bible to out of that thousand people? Take a wild guess. Probably none. That's the correct answer. Not one person out of a thousand person was quoted one word from the Bible. Hmm. That Bible, this is going to be a, a really powerful thing for me to say that Bible is not Jesus's Bible and it's not mother Mary's Bible. It is not their story. Let me tell you something. Let me put this in a real simple way to you. Let me ask you a quick, some really simple questions. Do you think that God loves you? Yes. Dumb question, right? And do you think God wants you to be happy? Yes. Okay. So do you think God wants you to feel good about yourself? Yes. Because the more you feel good about yourself, the more love you have to share with other people. Is that correct? Correct. Right. So anybody or any book that tells you that you're a sinner is not coming from God. Because God wants you to feel happy and he wants you to feel good about yourself. Anybody who tells you that you're a sinner, which makes you feel bad about yourself, is not God. Because God loves you and wants you to be happy and feel good about yourself. Because the more you feel good about yourself the more love you have to give to your fellow man and and to your and to everybody right and i've Is heard it, people even say and i like this that you know the bibles i know when we had them when i was growing up they had the red words for when jesus spoke you know if you just read those words <laughs> it teaches you how to love and how to treat your neighbor and that Jesus felt we had just as much power within us as he had within him. There's no doubt. Yeah. There's no doubt. You know, Jesus studied at the mystery schools in Egypt. It's Egypt is right next to Israel. That's the first place he went. It's just common sense. Just look at the map. Spirituality was so popular in Egypt. And from there, he, he loved to sail, he told us, because my ex-girlfriend was a channeler. And, you know, she channeled a lot of this information directly from him that he gave to me through her so these things could be in the book. And then he took the Red Sea south, just look at the map, and then he went over to the east and he went to India and he studied from the gurus and the yogis in India. Those gurus and yogis have been practicing healing, magical things, meditation. They've been they've been teaching that stuff for 5000 years. 
He learned that stuff from them. He didn't invent that stuff. He didn't invent healing. He learned how to do it from the healing masters in India who were yogis and gurus over there. From there, he went to a Buddhist monastery in Tibet, and he studied Buddhism in Tibet. The first thing you learn in Buddhism is how to meditate. Simple. He learned how to meditate, in, you know, and he learned how to heal people. And when he was 30 years old and he went back to Israel to reconnect with his family, he was the only guy who had been over there because India is pretty far away from the ocean, from from where Magdala, where Mary Magdalene was from, and Nazareth, which was right next to Magdala, um, which is where you know he was he was born, and he knew how to do healing and magical things, and he was the only guy who now knew how to do it because he was the only guy in his little town over there who had ever been to India and learned that stuff. Now, he would never put anybody on a – he would never – he doesn't talk down to anybody. I've heard a thousand people share their conversation with him, and he's always telling people you need to see your own divinity. You know, you need to, you need to love yourself. Um, it, it's such a basic thing of, of what he's talking about, this thing about having love for – I don't want to say your fellow man because it sounds like you're excluding women, but having love for people, right. whether you know, whether you know people or not. I mean, you can really tell what kind of person someone is by how they act to strangers. Very true. Because a person, you know, a person who is an evolved spiritual person will treat strangers with love and kindness. Very true. David, I just want to be mindful of time here because uh, sure. we'd agreed on the time. I want to, um, first of all, there's so much more. <laughs> there's so much more. If you could do a couple things. Tell us the name of your book. and okay, the, the book is called The True Story of Jesus and His Wife, Mary Magdalene. You can get it on my website, which is davidyoungmusic.com, or you can get it on Amazon. Now, it's available as a written book that's a big, like, coffee table-sized book that's 13 inches by 10 inches, okay? Every page is in color because while all of this stuff was evolving in my life, I started to paint again. And I made 150 paintings in a year and a half in between doing 150 oh, events. Oh, my goodness. Um, most of those paintings were between four feet and seven feet. Incredible. And um, while I was putting the book together, I realized – after I had come back from France, I realized that I had painted – there's a very famous cave in, in the south of France called the Cave of Mary Magdalene. And people come from all over the world to go to this cave because this is the cave where Mary Magdalene lived. And you know, there's all this historical references that's really true that she really did live there. So most people in the south of France know that Mary Magdalene lived there, but most people don't know that she saved Jesus' life and they made their way to the south of France together. And once they got to this cave at the top of the mountain in the south of France, they had their fourth child. Um, that child's name was Sarah and Jesus lived to be 72 years old and Mary Magdalene lived to be in her 30s. I'm, I'm sorry, in her 50s. They met when he was in his 30s. And so this is one of the things that's in my book and – when I was at Unity of Sedona last year, I shared the whole story about this Roman soldier who was friends with Mary Magdalene, who took him down off the cross after six hours because it was on the eve of Passover. And there was an ancient Roman law that said a Jewish person could not be tortured over a Jewish holiday. So that's why he was taken down off the cross after six hours. And this Roman soldier put him in a tomb while he was in a coma. He was having a near-death experience because his body had gone into shock. Anybody who had suffered that kind of torture would go into shock. And each day, this Roman soldier let Mary Magdalene into the tomb so she could change the bandages on his hands and on his feet and on his rib. And on the third day, this Roman soldier brought a wooden cart that was covered by hay. This wooden cart was pulled by a horse. The Roman soldier took Jesus's body out of the tomb while he's in a coma he puts his body in the center of the cart and he covers his body with the hay. So now the cart just looks like 
it's covered with hay. You can't tell that there's a man in a coma under under the hay. Mary Magdalene rode the horse, and that is how they escaped. When I shared that story at Unity of Sedona about a year and a half ago, this woman raised her hand and she said, I am the office manager here at Unity of Sedona, and we have a monthly Mary Magdalene channeling group where about 15 of us women channel Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene gave us the exact same story you just told about the wooden cart, the hay, the Roman soldier, and the horse. And we bought every single book that was channeled by Jesus, Mary Magdalene, or Mother Mary. And that story about how he survived is not in any book. My book is the first book that this is in. And I have my book available as an audio book with me narrating the story and my music underneath it. It's also available as an ebook that has my paintings in the background. So the whole ebook is in color. And if that's not enough, I did the ebook and the audio book in Spanish too. So if you prefer <laughs> to have, you know. Great. Oh, thank you so much. Now, the big question is you've left me wanting to download <laughs> one of your um, CDs like right away so I can meditate. Where would we get started and what would you recommend? Because I, I just think it's fascinating. I know your music's beautiful anyways, because I've heard some of it. And I know healers play it and healing centers play it and massage places play it. I mean, it's just, it's all over the place. But for each one of us to have a personal experience, what what would you suggest? If we go to well, da davidyoungmusic.com? Yeah, you go there and you just mm -hmm. click on meditation music. It's okay. on the top. And it'll show you the, the the CDs in that category. And the most popular CDs are Creation, Waves of Serenity, Healing Chakras, and Peace for Now. There are other CDs in that category also. But if you want you know, something to start with, I'd recommend. And I honestly, I meditate to my own music. You know, it, 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 when as a listener, when I'm, when I'm meditating to it, it, it works for me. It takes me into that space, you know? Yeah. And don't you also have some music on affirmations, something like that? Yeah. I have, I have six CDs that are approved by the American Psychological Association, and that's pretty rare. And they each have my voice singing a mantra. Blended in way in the back of the music so you hardly hear it. It almost sounds like a whisper. But I have a CD called I Have Everything I Need and All is Well. It's Time to Let Go and I'm Okay. I Am a Blessing. I Am Loved. My Mind is Clear. My Mind is Calm. With Every Breath I Take, My Body Heals Itself. And Just Be, It's All About Peace. Absolutely. So I have six different of, of those. Uh, they're called musical affirmations. Mm -hmm. And it has the flutes and all the relaxing, beautiful instrumental music. But my voice is blended in really, really subtly in the background. So you hardly hear it. But that, that message goes into your subconscious. And your, your subconscious mind picks up on that. And, you know, it responds to that. It's been really fun going on your website because you can listen to snippets of music. And... I think, and there's albums with me singing too on my yes. website, you know, and music videos and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, you're one talented man, and I'm so grateful we got to talk today. And then also, when just to our listener, when we stop recording this, David and I are going to brainstorm a little because I do believe he will be attending and playing his music at We Don't Die Orlando. So, We Don't Die Orlando dot com is the website, March 29th through 31st. And um, fingers crossed you'll be there and, and bless us with some of this beautiful music. That's the plan. Well, I'm, I'm planning on it. I, I've, done, I've done conferences for people who've had near-death experiences. And I want to say to the people who are listening out there mm -hmm. that <clears throat> if you've never been to a conference that's all about near-death experiences, in an hour you're going to look at life different. It's going to change the way you look at life and the way you look at death. You're going to hear people who are normal, normal looking people, normal people sharing experiences of what it was like when when they had a car accident or when they went into a coma and they experienced the heavenly dimension. I'm telling you, after an hour, you will not look at life the same. It, that was such an important part of my growth and my whole process in being less skeptical about all this stuff 
was going to those those seminars or those workshops about near death experiences because it makes so much sense. And once you can't take those words out of your head, once you hear people share these different stories, you know, you can't remove that from your head because it's not intelligent to continue looking at life the same way once you've heard somebody who really has had a full consciousness near death experience. Oh, David, I hope you can sit in on our whole conference because as in addition to near death experiences, there's something called shared death experiences. And one of our speakers talks about that. We've got a physical medium there who is also a does a trance drum demonstration, Scott Milligan. There's a scientist coming from Brazil who not only records voices from people in the afterlife, but she's been working with technology and she's gotten video and pictures of people in the afterlife. We've got some of the best mediums on planet earth, even a guy who's a spirit artist that not just can tell you who your loved ones are, but he can uh, draw a portrait. It, we've got some really incredible people. So talk about uh, once it's in your mind, you can't, it'll never leave you. The, to me, like your music, it's transformational. Who you were before and then who you are after. You're a different person. And I'm so excited to listen to your music with the intention of opening up to a higher realm, reconnecting with a loved one, whatever is in store. Definitely something to practice. It's not five minutes like you say. Um, but it just, it opens us up as human beings, because if we don't die, you're, you're giving us a tool that we can connect to our soul. And I believe the events that I'm starting to put on do the same thing. Absolutely. Wow. Well, I'm thrilled that we've talked today. Do you have any closing words or anything you haven't shared that you'd like to, or it's just a word of inspiration? Our minds are like, bre are like umbrellas. They're only useful when they're open. Everything that you think that you've learned that you think is your intelligence is not your intelligence. There's a difference between your memory and your intelligence. Any person that people call a genius in this world are people who are tapping into the other dimension, the heavenly dimension, and pulling ideas down from the heavenly dimension into the physical dimension. There's no difference between somebody you call a genius and yourself. Because the only thing that makes a person a genius is the fact that they're accessing knowledge and information that we all have access to. Pretty great. Thank you for a great conversation. It's been very thought-provoking, oh, very interesting, and very inspiring. I mean, it's just to, to hear stories of all those people who have had just a great experience and there's something to do with the, what did you call it when the triharmonic? No, what did you call it? Yeah, it's like a triharmonic tone because the two flutes tone. make a third tune that's a harmonic frequency. And I don't know about you who's listening, but I'm I'm feeling the pull that I want to experience this. Oh, David, I can't wait to meet you. Thank you for being our guest today. My pleasure. Oh, and to our listener, thank you for spending this time with David Young and myself. A reminder, his website is davidyoungmusic.com. You can come meet him in person. We don't die Orlando.com. Just a reminder, our home base for this show is we don't die radio.com where now you can find 302 episodes all about evidence of the afterlife and living an empowered life. So in closing, my name is Sandra Champlain, and I'm always so happy to be your host on We Don't Die Radio. I do believe that life is an education for the soul and that your life here on earth is important. We're going to close this episode with just a little bit of music from David Young. And then again, I encourage you to go pick yourself up a download or CD, davidyoungmusic.com. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you soon. Mm -hmm.